that he's done for us. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you all very much. God bless. Well, good morning again, everyone. So many of you, I'm pretty sure, know that I'm preparing for a trip to El Camino this September. For those who might not be familiar with it, El Camino is an ancient pilgrimage to Santiago de Compostela, which is in Spain, where the remains of St. James the Elder are buried. And we have records of people making this pilgrimage from as far back as the 800s. But it's become increasingly popular in perhaps the last 50 years or so. Martin Sheen made a movie about it entitled The Way. El Camino means the way or the road in Spanish. Now, there are lots of paths to Santiago de Compostela, but the most famous one is El Camino Francés, which starts in France, goes over the Pyrenees, and crosses the northern part of Spain for about 500 miles. It takes four to six weeks to walk it. I'm not doing that. <laughs> Two friends and I are going to take El Camino Frances, but we're going to start about 130 miles out and walk for 10 days to Santiago. So that's about 13 miles a day. I've already been in training for it by walking for at least an hour on the treadmill every other day or so, and then uh, walking down on the Baltimore Annapolis Trail, you know, the one that starts in Glen Burnie? I do that for about three hours on my day off. So far, I've walked from Glen Burnie to Annapolis and back again. backpack in tow. <laughs> now, there are lots of reasons that people make the pilgrimage. Some go for the plenary indulgence that gets you out of purgatory. Yeah, I'm not going for that. <laughs> Others go for the serenity of the walk, or just for the exercise or physical challenge of it. When I checked with my Jewish cardiologist, ca cardiologist if it was okay for me to take the trip, he said, oh, wow, that's on my bucket list. I doubt he's going for the indulgences. Now, there's a lot of planning that goes into the pilgrimage. Not only do you have to prepare physically for it, you have to know what to take and where to stay. Accommodations range from group dormitories with bunk beds, which require you to bring your own bedding, to full-fledged hotels with all of the comforts of home, and then some. When I asked my friends where they wanted to stay, because it would affect how much we had to carry in our backpacks, one said, Hotels all the way. <laughs> I'll take my chances in purgatory. <laughs> well, in today's gospel, Jesus calls his apostles together and sends them on a mission. And most of us are familiar with the story, I imagine and see it pretty much as a story about commissioning missionaries to go out to preach the good news and to travel light. And while that's certainly part of the story, it really is much deeper than that. 
So we want to look at it a little bit more carefully. If you want to follow along, we're at Mark chapter 6. We'll begin at uh, verse 7. So Jesus summons the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over unclean spirits. Then he instructed them to take nothing for the journey but a walking stick. Now, first, right there, the word, the journey. The Greek word that is used, we've encountered before, is hados. Hados in Greek means the way, the road, the journey. Just like el camino means the road or the way. And hados becomes particularly important in the early Christian community because if you remember, the followers of Jesus were not originally called Christians. That comes much later in their history. They were originally called the followers of the way, hados. Jesus himself, if you remember in the Gospel of John, says, I am the way. So that whenever you're reading the Gospels and you see a reference to the way, the road, or the journey, it's really a symbol for discipleship. Because as disciples of Christ, we are all on the way. So by Jesus calling his 12 apostles together and then sending them on the way, This becomes a model for all of us as disciples of Christ, not just those who are going to be missionaries. Then we we see that Jesus sends them two by two, and then in in verse 10 says, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave from there. So clearly, in Jesus' mind, this journey of discipleship is not a one-person show. It's going to take others to be with us. We are not meant to travel this road alone, but we need companions along the way. And that's going to be essential if we are going to be disciples of Christ. No one can be a disciple of Christ completely on his or her own. And then finally, Jesus instructs them to take nothing for the journey but a walking stick. No food, no sack, no money in their belts. They were, however, to wear sandals, but not a second tunic. Now, often... Our inclination when we read these two verses is to focus on what Jesus tells them not to take. And so we have all kinds of ideas and homilies and essays written about how we should be possession-free as disciples of Christ and how we should not allow ourselves to be burdened by our possessions. And while all of that certainly is significant and true for us as Christians, what I think we miss when we focus on what not to take is we miss what Jesus is telling us to take. And what he tells us to take is a walking stick and sandals on our feet. Now, as someone who's preparing for El Camino, I certainly am aware of the need for good footwear and travel gear. But you see, the idea of a a walking stick or a staff and sandals is much more, again, symbolic than that. The staff, if you think about it, particularly in the Old Testament, the staff represents the authority of God. Okay, remember Moses? Virtually every miracle that was effected through Moses was done by Moses using his staff because that represented not Moses' authority, 
but the authority of God given to Moses. And when you see in this passage at the very beginning that Jesus gives the disciples authority over unclean spirits, the idea then of them taking a walking stick or a staff is to constantly remind them of the authority that Jesus has given them over the unclean spirits so that they will never be afraid to confront them because the staff will remind them of the power they have in Jesus Christ. But it's more than that even, because when you add to that the staff and the sandals, it brings back the, the, to mind the imagery of the Exodus. Now, if you remember, in the Exodus, when God was freeing the Israelites from slavery in Egypt, there were ten plagues that were imposed on the Egyptians. And the final plague, you'll remember, was the death of the firstborn son. And when God effected that punishment, that would be the sign to the Israelites that it was time to flee Egypt, that he had now secured their freedom. But they weren't actually going to be sure exactly when God was going to do that. So God teaches them to have a Passover meal, right, to celebrate and to remember what God is doing. And he gives them this instruction when they celebrate that meal. This, this comes from Exodus 12, verse 11. This is how you are to eat it, eat the Passover meal. With your loins girt, sandals on your feet, and your staff in hand, you will eat it in a hurry. The idea being that you never know when God is going to affect his will, and you need to be ready for it, lest you miss the opportunity. So you see, when Jesus instructs his disciples to go out and carry only their walking stick and to wear their sandals, he is telling them, be ready. You never know when God is going to bless you. So when you put all of this together, you see that what Jesus is instructing all of us to be as disciples of his, to be empowered by his grace to confront the evils of this world, to go with companions along the journey so that we can support and strengthen each other, and then always to be ready to receive the blessing of God whenever it comes. Now, as disciples of Christ, we are always on the way. Whether we're raising a family, studying in school, working at a job, serving the needs of our community, we're always on the way. And so, as disciples on the way, we are also always missionaries for Christ, in a sense, confronting the challenges of our world, Re rejoicing in its blessings, or just moving from one day to the next. And we all know that sometimes that journey can be daunting. Illness or death can strike our families, and it seems that our whole world is turned upside down. We become anxious or fearful of what lies on the road ahead. We can face failures at school or at work, we can lose our jobs or struggle financially. And we have to deal with all of the anger and the frustration that comes with that, as well as the fear of what lies ahead. Or we can see the violence in our city streets, and we know it's getting closer and closer to home every day. And we can despair that there doesn't seem to be any solution to it. And we just don't know where it's all going to go. All of us, at some point 
encounter hardship along the way. And we're often tempted just to give up, just to get off that road, to crawl into a hole and hope that it all goes away. And you see, Jesus, of course, knew this from the very beginning. And that's why he gave his disciples authority over unclean spirits. You don't have to believe in nasty little demons running around in order to know that there is evil in this world. And that evil ranges from obstacles to our abilities or our resources to accomplish what we need, to outright wicked people who are working to defeat us and all that we hold dear. But regardless of what those unclean spirits are, we have to start with the confidence that Jesus has already given us authority over them. And we can defeat them if we begin with that confidence that he has already given us the ability to do so. But that's also then why Jesus sends us out two by two, because he knows that no one can take this journey on their own. We need each other, and we have each other all along the way. That's the whole point of family and friends and, yes, church, so that we each have each other as we walk this journey. Relying on others is not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of strength because it's the help and care, the support and love, the knowledge and skill of others that strengthen us on this journey and gives us the ability to defeat the demons. So don't ever be afraid to ask for help. That's why Jesus sends us out to by two. And finally, we always have to remember that we have our staff in hand and sandals on our feet because we never know when God is going to act. You know, sometimes we sit around waiting for God to act in a certain way because that's how we've decided God should act. And when you sit around doing nothing, Folks, we miss so many opportunities. The fact is that we know that God can act in big and powerful and magnificent ways. But the other fact of the matter is we have no idea when and how God is going to do those things. So carry your staff and wear your sandals, church, because God might just have a blessing for you the minute you walk out this door. And what a shame it would be if you missed it. I sure have learned a lot in preparing for this pilgrimage to El Camino. Did you know, for example, that the number one choice of fabric for underwear while traveling is polyester? <laughs> it's lightweight, it doesn't take up much space, and you can wash it in the sink the night at night and it'll be dry by the next morning. <laughs> so you don't have to take as much of it. <laughs> and you thought cotton was the fabric of our lives. <laughs> but if I'm worried about how much I should take on this journey, or how little I can get away with, then I'm missing the whole point. It doesn't matter how much you take. It only matters what you take. 
Jesus has given you authority over unclean spirits. Take it with you. Jesus has given you a church to strengthen you along the way. Take it with you. And Jesus has given you a staff and sandals to ready you for the journey ahead. Take them with you. Because you just never know. God and Jesus can bless your life in a moment's notice. Amen.